Buenas tardes. El Centro de Estudios Internacionales y el Centro de Estudios de Asia y África del Colegio de México, Colmex, la División de Historia del Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económica, CIDE, junto al Comité Organizado de la Semana Árabe en México 2014, les dan la más cordial bienvenida a la quinta edición de este magno evento. A continuación, presentamos la trayectoria de nuestro invitado, el doctor Gabriel Peterberg, quien impartirá una conferencia magistral como parte del seminario permanente Las Claves Políticas del Medio Oriente. Gabriel Peterberg imparte clases y escribe sobre el Imperio Otomano, Colonialismo y Palestina e Israel, entre otras investigaciones publicó Anatomy and Tragedy en el 2003 y The Return of Zionism in, eh, perdón, en el 2008. Eh, Peterberg escribe para New Left Review y London Review of Books. Uh, le pedimos al doctor Gabriel Peterberg que inicie la conferencia. Gracias. Bueno, perdón. <risa> Hola, este, buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Eh, no voy a hablar mucho todavía. Eh, bueno, ya saben, aquí está el doctor Gabriel Peterberg. Es un orgullo y un honor tenerlo con nosotros. Este, eh, el seminario permanente que estamos iniciando es un seminario permanente eh, que inicia el día de hoy eh, eh, del Centro de Estudios Internacionales y del Centro de Estudios de Asia y África. Este, eh, ahora eh, doy la palabra al doctor Jean, eh, Jean-François Proudhon, que es este, coordinador académico de, eh, general académico del Colegio de México. Bien, bueno, solo voy a dar unas breves palabras para, para anunciar el inicio de eh, este seminario permanente que lleva y llevará por título eh, Claves Políticas del Medio Oriente. Es un seminario conjunto entre el Centro de Estudios Internacionales y el Centro de Estudios de Asia y África del Colegio de México. Y nuestra, nuestra idea es eh, eh, asegurar eh, la realización de una serie de conferencias sobre el Medio Oriente aquí en el Colegio de México, con la presencia de destacados especialistas de la región. Poco nuestra idea, y para ir, un, digamos, aprovechamos el contexto de esta Semana Árabe, pero lo que queremos es crear un espacio plural de uh, discusión y de presentación de conferencias sobre temas importantes del Medio Oriente aquí en el Colegio de México. Pensamos que es una iniciativa relativamente original aquí en México y uh, queremos que ese espacio sea un lugar de encuentro entre especialistas de la región de instituciones mexicanas y de instituciones internacionales. Eso quiere decir que, entre otras cosas, queremos eh, poder recibir eventualmente a especialistas de universidades del mundo árabe, pero también de universidades de Israel y también a especialistas de países como Turquía para discutir de uh, distintos uh, problemas relevantes eh, de la región. Entonces, hoy pues contamos con la presencia del eh, profesor Gabriel Peterberg, de la Universidad de California en Los Ángeles, que uh, va a dar inicio a este seminario eh, con eh, una conferencia sobre eh, las eh, colonias de asentamientos eh, en eh, Israel. Y bueno, sin más entonces, eh, Gabriel, me da mucho gusto que seas eh, el primer conferencista eh, y pensamos que cada año tendremos por lo menos a cuatro invitados internacionales y probablemente buscaremos también eh, las eh, presentaciones por parte de especialistas mexicanos sobre el Medio Oriente. Bien, sin más, te doy la palabra. Muchas gracias. Eh, eh, es un honor eh, estar aquí y... Quiero decir mil gracias a Gilberto y a Marta y a Miguel y Omar 
y Shadi. Eh, es, es un placer en, en mi vida, no me imaginaba que aquí en México City hay tan interés en el Medio Oriente generalmente y en, eh, en Israel Palestina específicamente. La otra cosa que quiero decir es que yo hablo español, pero si trato de dar una conferencia en español, ustedes van a pensar, como dicen los argentinos, que soy un boludo. Y no quiero esto. Entonces, tengo que dar mi conferencia en inglés y, por favor, discúlpame. Pero puedo, las la cuestiones y eh, comentarios y todo eso puede ser en español, lo entiendo perfectamente. Y voy a responder en inglés, pero puede ser que así eh, fue más, eh, va a ser más fácil. So, my, is it, my presentation is in two steps. First, I briefly present settler colonialism as a global phenomenon, as well as comparative settler colonialism as a field of study. Subsequently, I examine the Zionist colonization of Palestine and the state of Israel within that context. Concerning the examination of the Zionist colonization of Palestine, I show that it was settler colonial both objectively and subjectively. That is, that both the objective material formation and the subjective orientation of prominent, prominent Zionist figures were settler colonial. So I begin with settler colonialism in general. European expansion and conquest from the 16th century onwards produced two related but clearly distinguishable forms of colonialism. One was metropole colonialism, in which European powers conquered and ruled vast territories without the immigration of Europeans seeking to make these territories their national home. British India is a good example of this form of colonialism. The other type was settler colonialism, in which conquest brought with it substantial waves of European settlers, who, with the passage of time, sought to make the colony their national patrimony. The US and Australia are prime examples, but there are many others. This process entailed a relationship with the indigenous people that could range from dispossession to elimination or from slavery for which for, the mo which for the most part did not use the native population to cheap labor, depending on the economic and social formation of the given settler society. Power relations within the triangle comprising metropole, indigenes, and settlers have yielded one of three outcomes. The settlers managed to gain independence from the metropole and establish a nation state with dire consequences for the indigenous people the US, Australia, and Israel, for instance. The settlers could not prevail, too, the settlers could not prevail and eventually had to leave, as happened in French Algeria and British Kenya. Or the settlers won independence, but with the passage of time were unable to prevent indigenous reassertion, as in South Africa and Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. For a long time, colonialism tended to be associated exclusively with the first form, namely metropole colonialism. The systematic and especially comparative examination of settler colonialism as a historically and analytically discrete phenomenon is relatively recent. This implies neither that all settler societies are identical nor that their historically distinct trajectories should be discarded but rather that they are comparable and that the comparison adds invaluable insight to the study of these societies by showing that they constitute a global phenomenon. The achievements of the comparative study of settler colonialism have been at once scholarly and political. Several of these colonies gave birth to powerful nation states which have asserted their own hegemonic narratives both nationally and internationally. The comparative field not only questions these narratives through countervailing evidence and interpretation, but also offers an alternative account of the social formations themselves. In this process, three fundamental features common to the hegemonic settler myths are undermined. The first 
The first of these is the putative uniqueness of each settler nation. The second is their privileging of the settler's intention as sovereign subjects at the expense of the consequences, be what may the intentions, and at the expense of the native's consciousness. Third is the supposed inconsequence of the natives or the native presence to the form each settler society takes. In other words, the conflict with the natives is not denied, but the fundamental role that this conflict between settlers and natives played in shaping the identity of the settler nation is written off. Comparative settler colonialism is a sine qua non for a proper understanding of not only the past, but also the present perfect. Here, the work of the Australian scholar Patrick Wolfe has been pivotal. The originality and insight of Wolfe's writings on this issue lie in his appreciative critique of anti-colonial writers like Amilcar Cabral and Franz Fanon, and later ones like Gayatri Spivak. For all the homage paid to heterogeneity and difference, Wolfe observes, the bulk of post-colonial theorizing is disabled by an oddly monolithic and surprisingly unexamined notion of colonialism. One of the reasons for this, he argues, and now I quote Wolf, consists in the historical accident, or is it, that the native founders of the post-colonial canon came from franchise or dependent as opposed to settler or creole colonies. This gave these guerrilla theoreticians the advantage of speaking to an oppressed majority on whose labor coloni the colonizing minority was vulnerably dependent. But what if the colonizers are not dependent on native labor? Indeed, what if the natives themselves have been reduced to a small minority whose survival can hardly be seen to furnish the colonizing society with more than a remission from ideological embarrassment, unquote. Wolf attributes decisive explanatory significance to the fact that, in contrast to the colonial formation that Cabral or Fanon confronted, settler colonies were not primarily established to extract surplus, surplus value sorry, from indigenous labor. Rather, they were premised on displacing indigenes from or replacing them on the land. This created the situation in which it was difficult to speak of an articulation between colonizer and native, since the determinate articulation is not to a society, but directly to the land, a precondition of social organization. The bottom line is a formulation that other scholars of settler colonialism understandably cite. I quote Wolf, settler colonies were, are, premised on the elimination of the native societies. The split tensing reflects a determinate feature of settler colonization. The colonizers come to stay. Invasion is a structure, not an event, unquote. In a masterful essay, Carol Pateman, my colleague from UCLA, puts forth the notion of the settler contract. It emanates from her collaboration with Charles Mills that brings together her book, The Sexual Contract, and his book, The Racial Contract. Their joint study broaches the extent to which the contract as such entails perforce domination. In the essay, Bateman offers a narrative of the term terra nullius in the context of the history of three settler societies, the US, Australia, and Canada. She explores through this term the ideological mechanisms used by the settlers to justify and legitimize their projects and offers the reading of Grotius and Locke that runs against the grain of the main body of scholarship on early modern political thought. Bateman explains that in the racial contract, Charles Mills discusses an expropriation contract appropriate to the white settler state, where the establishment of a society thus implies the denial that the society already existed. She then offers a succinct definition. I quote Bateman. 
The settler contract is a specific form of the expropriation contract and refers to the dispossession of and rule over native inhabitants by British settlers in the two new worlds. Colonialism in general subordinates, exploits, kills, rapes, and makes maximum use of the colonized and their resources and lands. When colonists are planted in a terra nullius, an empty state of nature, the aim is not merely to dominate, govern, and use, but create a civil society. Therefore, the settlers have to make an original settler contract. I move now to Zionism, and first I want to say something about Zionism as an ideology. Zionism has had two spatial dimensions, the Central and East European impact of its origins and the settler colonial aspect of its actualization in the Middle East. These two dimensions are inexorable, and if I occasionally make a distinction, it is only for analytical purposes. Zionism as a worldview and praxis is underlain by a foundational prin principle or myth that has three manifestations, the negation of exile, the return to the land of Israel, and the return to history. These manifestations are inextricably intertwined in the master narrative of Zionism, the story that explains how we got to where we are and when we sh where we should go henceforth. The negation of exile establishes continuity between an ancient past in which there existed Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel and the present that renews it in the resettlement of Palestine. Between the, the two lies no more than a kind of interminable interim. Depreciation of the period of exile is shared by all Zionists, if with differing degrees of rigidity and derives from what, is, from what is, in their outlook, an incontestable presupposition. From time immemorial, the Jews constituted a territorial nation. It follows that a non-territorial existence must be abnormal, incomplete, and inauthentic. In and of itself, as a historical experience, exile is devoid of significance. Although it may have given rise to cultural achievements of moment, exile could not, by definition, have been a wholesome realization of the nation's geist. So long as they were condemned to it, Jews, whether as individuals or community, could lead at best a partial or transitory existence, waiting for the redemption of ascent, Aliyah, once again to the land of Israel, the only site on which the nation's destiny could be fulfilled. Within this mythical framework, exilic Jews always lived provisionally as potential or proto-Zionists, longing to return to the land of Israel. Here, the second expression of the foundational myth complements the first. In Zionist terminology, the recovery by the people of its home promised to deliver the normalization of, the, of Jewish existence. And the site designated for the reenactment of Exodus would be the territory of the biblical story, as elaborated in the Protestant culture of the 18th and 19th centuries. Zionist ideology defined this land as empty. This did not mean that Zionist leaders and settlers were ignorant of the presence of Arabs in Palestine or mulishly ignored them. Israel was empty in a deeper sense, for the land too was condemned to an exile as long as there was no Jewish sovereignty over it. It lacked any meaningful or authentic history awaiting redemption with the return of the Jews. The best known Zionist slogan a land without a people to a people without a land, expressed a twofold denial <clears throat> of the historical experience of both the Jews in exile and of Palestine without Jewish sovereignty. Of course, since the land was not literally empty, its recovery required the establishment of a settler colonial hierarchy, sanctioned by biblical authority of its historic custodians over such intruders as might remain after the return. Jewish settlers were to be accorded exclusive privileges deriving from the Old Testament, and Palestinians Arab 
were to be treated as part of the natural environment. The Zionist settlers were collective subjects who acted, and the native Palestinians became ob objects who were acted upon. The third way in which the foundational myth is articulated, the return to history, reveals more than any other the extent to which Zionist ideology was underpinned by the emergence of romantic nationalism and German historicism in 19th century Europe. Its premise is that the natural and irreducible form of human collectivity is the nation. From the dawn of history, peoples have been grouped into such units, and though they might be at one time or another undermined by internal divisions or oppressed by external forces, they are eventually bound to find political self-expression in the shape of sovereign nation-state. The nation is the autonomous historical subject par excellence, and the state is the telos of its march towards self-fulfillment. According to this logic, so long as they were exiles, the Jews remained a community outside of history, within which all European nations dwelt. Only nations that occupy the soul of their homeland and establish political sovereignty over it are capable of shaping their own destiny and so of, of entering history by this logic. The return of the Jewish nation to the land of Israel, overcoming its docile, its docile passivity in exile, could alone allow it to rejoin the history of civilized peoples. Now I move to the Zionist colonization. The land labor formation of the Zionist colonization of Palestine was created, and many people are not aware of this, was created in the first three decades of this process, from 1882 to 1914, with crucial political implications. Naturally, important developments subsequently followed, and I shall address some of them. It is, however, imperative to dwell on that formative period. In Zionist parlance, the formative period I wish to analyze is defined by two waves of immigration and settlement. The ideologically loaded term in Hebrew for a wave of immigration is aliyah, or ascent, in the singular. The analysis of the formative period is inseparable from what is, in my view, the most important study of the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, namely Gershon Shafir's land, labor, and the origins of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, 1882 to 1914, which was published in 1920, no, sorry, 1989, so we are marking the 25th anniversary this year. This is the first book that introduced the framework of comparative settler colonialism to the study of the modern history of Palestine-Israel. It is a foundational text for a framework that is fast becoming a sine qua non for a critical understanding of that geography, both in the past and in the present. Shafir begins by simultaneously listing the main features that are historically specific to Zionism and to the Zionist colonization of Palestine in comparison to other frontiers of settlement and other movements of colonization. And by anticipating that the type of colonization that within a short while prevailed was that of the pure settlement colony. This is a crucial term, which I'll explain in a minute. He insists that while this historical specificity gave Zionist colonization a particular cast, it has not eliminated its fundamental similarity with other pure settlement colonies. This requires a clarification. In the taxonomy of settler colonies, two types are pertinent to our discussion. The first type is the plantation colony. In this formation, the settlers want from the indigenous people both land and cheap labor. The settler indigene fault line is therefore messy and porous, and settlers and natives are visible to one another on a daily basis. The second formation is the pure settlement colony, mentioned above. Here the settlers do not seek native labor. Moreover, they ideologically reject it. What they covet is the entirety of the land, or as much of it as they can seize. Therefore, in this pure settlement formation, from a settler perspective, the indigenous people are superfluous. 
Unsurprisingly, this is the most eliminatory formation of settler colonization. Shafir then adds a category to the system which he calls the ethnic plantation colony. It was based on, a Europe, on European control of land and the employment of local labor. The planters, in spite of their preference for local labor, also sought inconsistently and ultimately unsuccessfully massive European immigration. French Algeria was an example of this hybrid type. Shafir's counter-narrative, counter to the Zionist narrative, rests on the distinction between two stages of colonization, which overlap with the first two waves of Jewish immigration known in Zionist parlance as the first Aliyah, which is from 1882 to 1903, and included 20 to 30,000 immigrants, and the second Aliyah, 1904 to 1914, that included between 35,000 and 40,000 immigrants, so a slightly bigger wave of immigration. During that period, roughly 425,000 Palestinian Arabs lived in Palestine. The crucial moment that shaped the first Aliyah came when after early failures and supplicating to the Rothschilds, Baron Edmond de Rothschild entered the fray. Assisted by French experts, he re reorganized the first Aliyah colonies on the model of French agricultural colonization in North Africa. These colonies became ethnic plantations based on vineyards, which relied on a large, seasonal, unskilled and cheap Arab labor with a much smaller and better paid Jewish labor force and Jewish planters. Circa 1900, Rothschild ended his money-pouring involvement. This meant, among other things, that land accumulation came to a temporary halt because Rothschild had disappeared and the World Zionist Organization, which Herzl had founded in 1897, was still at the phase in which it opposed land accumulation prior to having a state on the basis of an international charter. The arrival of the second Aliyah immigrants, eventually the founders of labor Zionism and the State of Israel, Ben-Gurion was the most famous among them, in that context signaled the shift from the land as sphere of colonization to that of labor, and the concomitant shift from the ethnic plantation to that of pure settlement colony, which I shall argue in, persists until today. This is an original observation by Shafir that doesn't always get the notice it deserves. What is perhaps the most crucial step in the process of the Israeli nation-state formation out of a pure settlement colony emanated not from land as a lieu of colonization, but from that of labor. The shift occurred after the customary attempt to lower the standard of living in order to compete in the labor market against the Palestinian Arab workers had failed. In 1905, mem members of what was at that point one of the two labor Zionist parties called Hapoel Atzair, or the Young Worker, forsook the strategy, the, the strategy of downward wage for the purpose of market competitiveness and launched instead the campaign of, for the conquest of labor. That's how they called it, it's not my term. The goal was to conquer all jobs in Palestine for Jews, but especially in Jewish plantations, without lowering wages. This is the crucial point. This was accompanied by a demand from the Jewish planters to oust their Arab workers and hire Jewish ones instead for reasons of national colonization rather than economic considerations. As such, the struggle for the conquest of labor was unsuccessful. Its pivotal importance lies in its having engendered the appearance of the pure settlement colony as a state of mind, as the only way of institution and nation state building. It transformed the Jewish workers into militant nationalists who sought to establish a homogeneous Jewish society in which there would be no exploitation of Palestinians, nor will there be competition with the Palestinians, because there would be no Palestinians. From that crucial juncture, 
the workers' leadership moved back to continue the colonization of land through an alliance with a changing World Zionist organization and its two colonizing agencies, the Palestine, development, the Palestine Land Development Agency, which was founded in 1909, and Jewish National Fund, which was founded in 1901. In this venture, the actual settlers were guided by three German Jewish master experts of settlement, Arthur Rupin, Otto Warburg, and Franz Oppenheimer. In this process, the first cooperative settlements were founded, and with the arrival of more immigrants, colonization through various um, forms of cooperative settlement gained momentum. I'm referring here to the Kvutza, the Kibbutz, which is the most famous, and the Moshav, all created from 1908 to 1925. In 1920, the final and most powerful labor Zionist institution was established, namely the Histadrut. This was a multifaceted organization that consisted of a trade union, a settlement section, a construction and industrial arm, and health, consumption, and finance division. More than any other single institution, the Histadrut was the nation state in the making. It is a common mistake that leads to complete misunderstanding to see in the Histadrut only a trade union in the European mold. It is also not a coincidence that the position that made Ben-Gurion the uncontested leader of labor Zionism in the 1920s and catapulted him to the leadership of the World Zionist Organization and Jewish Agency in the 1930s and eventually to the Israeli premiership was that of the Histadrut Secretary General. This was his first meaningful uh, official position. The kibbutz famously represented as an attempt to create a socialist utopia, was the most successful example known to me of a pure settlement colony. Shafir's, Shafir offers a helpful summary. I quote him. The second Aliyah's revolution against the first Aliyah did not originate from opposition to settler colonialism as such, but out of frustration with the inability of the ethnic plantation colony to provide sufficient employment for Jewish workers, i.e. from opposition to the particular form of their predecessor's colonization. The second Aliyah's own method of settlement, and subsequently the dominant Zionist method, was but another type of European overseas colonization, the pure settlement colony also find, found in Australia, northern U.S., and elsewhere. Its threefold aim was control of land, employment that ensured the European standard of living, and massive immigration. This form of pure settlement rested on two exclusivist pillars, on the Jewish National Fund and on the Histadrut. The aim of the Jewish National Fund and the Histadrut were the removal of land and labor from the market, respectively, thus closing them off to Palestinian Arabs. Now I move to settler consciousness. The foregoing analysis of early and, in my view, formative Zionist colonization offered an objective portrayal of the material formation. I now wish to move to the subjective consciousness of a foremost Zionist leader and show that his thought and practice was that of a settler colonialist. Let me confess that I have been deeply influenced by Marxian thought but I do not subscribe to the crude and mechanistic Marxist, as distinguished from Marxian, distinction between based and superstructure. For the clarity of presentation, however, it is possible to consider the examination of the land labor formation as the material base and the forthcoming interpretation of consciousness as the superstructure. While scores of pro-Zionist scholars have been at pains to suppress the intrinsicality. I'm sorry for the postmodern term, mea culpa. I don't like it, but it seemed appropriate here. So, to suppress the intrinsicality of the Palestinian Arabs to the nature of the Zionist project and the settler colonial aspect of it, and no less committed Zionists manifested awareness 
of precisely that which would be later denied. This Zionist was Chaim Alozerov, 1899 to 1933, by far the intellectually brightest politician of note within labor Zionism. It is speculated that he, had his death not been untimely, he would have, been, he would have eclipsed Ben-Gurion. Dr. Haim Alozerov is best, almost only, known for his assassination in Tel Aviv on, June, on 16 June 1933. The assassins remain unidentified. Un he was then the maverick of Zionist politics, one of the leaders of the main Labour Party, Mapai, head of the political department of the Jewish agency, basically a foreign affairs minister. Alozerov was amidst negotiations with the Nazi leadership, which were meant to enable emigrating German Jews to salvage at least some of their wealth. The revisionist, meaning the right wing, the foundation of today's Likud, basically, the revisionist agitation against the negotiations and Alozerov personally peaked at that time, though it has not been conclusively shown that the killers were revisionists. Chaim Viktor Alozerov was born in 1899 in the Ukraine to well-off middle-class parents who spoke both Russian and German. He studied Hebrew at home with a private tutor. The family fled to Königsberg in Germany in 1905 during World War I and settled in Berlin. There Alozerov became engrossed in two worlds, German letters and cultures, and culture, sorry, through the gymnasium he attended, and Zionism through Apoel Atzair, again, the Young Worker Party. The latter was an anti-Marxist and for the most part non-socialist party, which was inspired by the Tolstoyan religion of labor, developed by the second Aliyah's father figure, A.D. Gordon. At the end of the war, he studied economics at Berlin University. In 1919, at the age of 20, for all of us who did doctorates much later. Uh, in 1919, at the age of 20, he published his first work, Jewish People's Socialism, which in a way amalgamated his intellectual and political sources of, of inspiration, Marx, Kropotkin, Russian Narodnik moods, and German romanticism. In 1923, he sub submitted his doctoral dissertation on Marx's concept of class and class struggle, and was offered the university position by his advisor, Werner Zombart, for those of you who know, a very famous and former sociologist at the time. The offer was declined, and in 1924, Alozerov immigrated to Palestine. In 1927, Alozerov published a remarkable essay in Hebrew, which he entitled On the Question of Joint Organization. It appeared in Apoel Atzair's daily and was included in the collection of his works published shortly after the assassination. It is not, not worthy, noteworthy that Zionist scholars have completely ignored this essay, not surprisingly, while it has been thoroughly discussed by two critical scholars, Zachary Lockman and me. The context should be clarified first. The foundation of the Istadrut as the culmination of creating a pure settlement colony, it was explicitly created for Hebrew workers rather than workers in general, in the domain of labor, reduced substantially the relevance of Arab-Jewish working class cooperation. At the same time, however, several factors temporarily prevented the total erasure of what was subsumed in contemporary discourse under the notion of joint organization. The first factor was the alternative labor market sustained by the colonial British state in mandatory Palestine, especially the British managed Palestine railways. The second was the fact that in the early 1920s, the nature of the Histadrut was still being contested by labor Zionism shrinking leftist parties, I mean true left, not Mapai, which insisted that the Histadrut be committed, at least to some extent, to non-ethnic or non-national workers' solidarity. By the late 1920s, these opposi oppositional parties either dissolved or were ousted from the organization by Ben-Gurion's iron hand. 
Third and last was a whole host of related things. The increasingly active Palestinian national movement, the attempt by the mandatory government to establish a legislative council, council for all the inhabitants of Palestine, Jews and Arabs, and the growing urban-based Palestinian working class. In practical terms, the need to unionize the railway workers was, that, was what gave rise to the question of joint organization. The category of railway, railway workers actually included also the employees of the mandatory government's postal and telegraph services. So we are talking about substantial amount of workers. The immediate interest of the Histadrut lay in the potential employment and membership that this sphere of labor offered, and in the assumption that if negotiation, negotiating the betterment of the Jewish workers' condition was to be successful, the Arab workers could not be ignored. As Secretary General, Ben-Gurion became intensively active in this evolving affair, and it was he who, in the Histadrut Council meeting of January 1922, coined the term joint organization of railway workers, which gradually came to embody the complex, complex prog problem of the universal commitment to worker solidarity versus the ethnic commitment to pure settlement exclusion, that is, to Zionism. Ben-Gurion's real reason was not at all universal class solidarity, to which he was vehemently opposed. The real reason was to use the unionization of railway, railway workers to oust the left from the Histadrut and to create a facade whereby the conflict with the native Palestinians was not really national, which he knew it was. The essay that contained Alozarov's intervention in the joint organization debate demonstrates in an original way how instinctive the consciousness of white settlers had become with the leading labor Zionists in two ways. One was that the fault line between settlers and indigenous people must be impregnable and controlled by the settlers. The other was that in order to draw analogous lesson, one must look at other settler societies. The essay was reacting not just to the context just charted, but also specifically to Ben-Gurion. For Alozarov, there was one and only one criterion by which the worthiness of joint organization ought to be judged. I quote Alozarov. Can the joint organization nullify the competition between the expensive and modern Hebrew labor and the cheap and primitive Arab labor and thereby create more amenable conditions for the collective Hebrew workers in their way for the conquest of labor? The answer to this question, rather than a preconceived doctrine, will determine our verdict on the method of joint organization." Unquote. The clear, this clear formulation vindicates, first of all, Sternhell's thesis that what labor Zionism offered in both practice and ideology was nationalist socialism, almost completely devoid of any humanistic and universalist appeal or content. Alozarov attributed no value whatsoever to joint organization, even in its pure settlement garb of autonomous national sections unless it could be shown to contribute to colonization, immigration, and settlement. Developing a detailed analysis based on a substantial economic data, he argued that joint organization would not only fail to enhance Zion the Zionist colonization of Palestine, but in certain respects, it would even hinder it. Concerning wages, Alozarov questioned the assumption that joint struggle would necessarily result in an upswing in the sphere of labor generated by the mandatory state. He, he maintained that in such struggles there is no uniform result and wages would depend on the nature of an actual national economy and its objective capacity. He insisted, however, that this was the wrong analogy for Palestine. He, what he did was to follow an analogy given by Otto Bauer, the famous Austrian thinker, and said that it was wrong for Palestine, although he agreed that it was correct for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
The hypothetical, I stress, hypothetical analogy that could illustrate the futility of joint organization was the migration of a few tens of thousands of American or Australian workers to Poland. When these American workers unionized, they could instantly face the competition of cheaper labor from the indigenous Polish workers. I quote him, Alozrov, what would we say if these American workers seriously suggested to solve the problem by uniting with the Polish workers in order to obtain an American wage level? level? We would say that such suggestion was to no avail." Unquote. Alozrov's point was that inter-ethnic joint organization could work at different regions and national economies like the unified Austrian economic domain which Bauer examined, but not at the type of economy Palestine represented. In the latter case, he pointed out, there are two economies that are simultaneously very different, yet porous to one another. These were what he called the native economy and the settler economy. The former was, primitive East, was a primitive Eastern economy, whereas the latter a relatively advanced European one. And while it was true that with the time the latter could transform the former, Palestine was still at the phase at which the Polish hypothetical analogy obtained. Clearly then, Alozrov put his weight behind the complete rejection of joint organization with Arab workers. His preferred course of action was introduced in the latter part of the essay through analogy, but this time actual rather than hypothetical. I think it is worth trying to find an equivalent to our problem in the annals of settlement in other countries. In other words, he, he was thinking in terms of comparative settler colonialism, understanding that that's, that's what they were doing. And to explain our situation by deduction. This is not easy. There is hardly an example of, the Zionist, of this, the Zionist endeavor of a colonizing people with European le level of needs, which does not resort to enforcement measures, because they couldn't, because it was the British who ruled at that point, measures, and its purpose is to transform a country in which there is a low level of wage into a site of mass immigration and mass settlement." Unquote. Alozrov proceeds with the settler colonial examples that won't do for the particular question of the interaction of settler workers and native workers in the labor market. The US was not adequate comparison and neither were New Zealand and Australia, quote, I quote Alozrov, since they nipped the problem in the bud through a fervent policy of white Australia. I don't have the time to, but this is a very meaningful policy of settler labor, white Australia. He then asserts that South Africa is almost the only case, I quote him, is almost the only case in which there is sufficient similarity in the objective conditions and problems as to allow us an analogy. To prevent misunderstanding in advance, it should be stressed that we know full well also the difference of the factors at work in the two countries' conditions and that we do not wish to attempt here to create a similar political construction, but only to compare to one another the polar points of the two countries' economy." Unquote. Comparably to Palestine, Alozrov maintains, in South Africa of the late 19th century and early decades of the 20th century too, there emerged a labor market that consisted of a minority of white workers who were unable to compete with the vast majority of Asian and African workers and whose material expectations and needs were much higher. <coughs> the gaps were especially substantial, Alozrov says, and greater than between Jews and non-Jews in Palestine, between, I quote him, Anglo-Saxons and the Bantu Negroes. Thus, the problem was even more serious in South Africa than in Palestine. Eventually, the solution came to be the color bar laws, which I can discuss more in the question time, but very significant again, which were introduced as a result of the political weight of the South African Labour Party and trade unions. These laws excluded all the non-Europeans from the skilled, supervisory, 
and better paid labor and preserve that domain for Europeans only. Alosrov remarks that it is not important, I quote him, it is not important whether we reject this politics or justify it. It is important here to highlight the economic reasons and social relations that led, rightly or wrongly, to the promulgation of color bar laws." Unquote. Alozarov's conclusion issued from the South African analogy and from an article by Lord Sidney Oliver, in which he recommended an absolute separation, segregation, he called it, of whites and blacks. Alozarov asserted that in the forthcoming decades, the only way to achieve the fulfillment of Zionism would be completely to, forg to forsake any notion of joint organization, joint anything really, and stiffen the separation into two economies, one modern, well-paid and conducive to an enhanced immigration and, settler and settlement, and the other undeveloped and low-paid, which would enable the settlers continuously to exclude the indigenous workers from their labor market. Certain data offered by Lockman suggests that the comparison could be carried even further. In, in other words, that even in the mandatory uh, labor market, the Zionists managed to impose higher and better wages for Jews or Jewish workers than to Palestinian workers. Mm -hmm. Now let me conclude, and instead of conclusion, or the conventional conclusion, let me offer a few observations that emanate from the historical analysis I've offered these observations may serve as a basis for discussion and comments, and they refer to the present. As Patrick Wolfe says, invasion is a structure, not an event. The situation in Israel-Palestine is still settler-colonial, developments notwithstanding. What fundamentally bothers Israel with regard to the Palestinians is neither their alleged terrorism nor their different culture, but their mere presence. Because in this formation, I insist, and I repeat, from a settler perspective, the indigenous people are superfluous. They are not needed. This is an underlying feature of the pure settlement formation. The indigenous people are superfluous from a settler perspective. Two, the underlying logic of what is called the two-state solution and in the 1930s and 1940s was referred to as partition, is the pure settlement formation. Beyond what is obvious in this political arrangement, which will never be achieved if it means real Palestinian sovereignty and statehood rather than Bantustanization, it is important to note that the Zionist and subsequently Israel leadership has never considered partition a static situation but a dynamic platform for the seizure of more land. This was uttered explicitly in internal communications by the settler leadership in the 1930s and the 1940s. Since the onset of the Oslo process especially, this dynamic impulse ex has expressed itself in the following, to put it mildly, duality. On the one hand, Successive Israeli governments, both Likud and Labour ones, declare an alleged acceptance of partition in good faith. On the other hand, they exponentially enhance the settlement project in the occupied territories, the territory designated for partition. Three, although Israel-Palestine as a settler colonial case is comparable, it simultaneously has its own distinctive features. Of these, I'd like to highlight one. The fact that the Zionist Israeli project is, so to speak, out of sync with its own pure settlement formation. What does this mean? It means that unlike other pure settlement formations like the US, Australia, and Argentina, in Palestine, for various reasons we can discuss, the victory of the settlers has not been sufficiently comprehensive to afford an irrevocable elimination, elimination of the indigenous community. Despite an exponentially growing asymmetry of power and severe limitations, the claim of the indigenous people of sovereignty and collective rights is still a viable question. This situation has led Israel in the past five decades to a strategy with the, which the late Israeli sociologist Baruch Kimmerling 
termed politicide from the morphology of genocide. What the strategy of politicide means is that Israel is aware that the massive ethnic cleansings of 1948 and 1967 cannot be repeated and the elimination of Palestinian presence cannot be achieved in a straightforward way. Therefore, the strategy is to fragment the Palestinians into small, ghettoized, and non-contiguous units, the survival of which is controlled by Israel. Each of these non-viable units is then subjected to what Israel chillingly calls mowing the lawn. Gaza is, of course, the outstanding instance. The ultimate goal of politicide is to eliminate the Palestinians as a viable collective capable of laying claim to sovereignty and collective rights. Let me end with a stanza from a poem penned by the late Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. The poem is Speech of the Rand Indian from 1992. I quote in translation one stanza. We bring you civilization, said the stranger. We are the masters of time, come to inherit this land of yours. March in Indian file, so we can tally you on the face of the lake, corpse by corpse. Keep marching, so the Gospels may thrive. We want God all to ourselves, because the best Indians are dead Indians in the eyes of our Lord. Thank you. Preguntas, comentarios, Alexander, por favor. Buenas noches, profesor Wittesberg. Uh, muchas gracias por su presentación, excelente. Eh, tengo um, dos preguntas rápidas. La primera, partiendo que eh, teóricos como Douglas North plantean que la moneda eh, es una institución que ofrece tanto soberanía como confianza, por un lado, y por otro lado teniendo en cuenta que las instituciones bancarias en el periodo de estudio de su investigación incluyeron por el lado palestino el Palestinian Currency Board que funcionó hasta los 30, 30 y algo, y luego fue reemplazado por el anglo Palestine Bank que fue creado con capital sionista y luego se convirtió en el Banco Leumi y luego fue la base de la banca central israelí. La pregunta es, ¿es posible pensar que la ausencia de un control monetario de una moneda propia a lo largo de la historia de la ocupación ha favorecido justamente esa política colonial israelí y ha privado a Palestina del control sobre la tierra y sobre el trabajo y sobre el capital? Esa sería básicamente una pregunta. La segunda es más corta, pero tal vez igual de compleja, y es cuál es su opinión sobre el colono actual, teniendo en cuenta que puede ser, que puede ir de cualquier país de América Latina, de cualquier país eh, europeo, de prácticamente cualquier lugar del mundo, y se genera una, una mezcla de identidades muy distintas a las del colono de las alillas. Con esas dos, muchas gracias. So, entonces, la cuestión es sobre la identidad en, en, en Latinoamérica o en no, Sudamérica. ¿Cuál es su opinión sobre el colono actual, que tiene tantos puntos de origen y que es muy diferente en cuanto a identidad al colono de las alillas? ¿Alguien más? Entonces, ¿qué, ¿qué pensar ahora de esa solución de los dos estados? ¿Qué sería la alternativa frente a digamos, esa solución que ha sido aceptada en organismos internacionales y que constituye el uh, horizonte de las negociaciones? Es algo que ha sido cuestionado últimamente. Daniel, 
Sí. Muchas gracias por su interesante ponencia, doctor. Yo quería cuestionar, bueno, preguntarle más que nada su opinión con respecto al tema de la judaización de la ciudad de Jerusalén. Es decir, el, eh, porque a lo largo de su ponencia hizo mucho énfasis en, en esas estructuras históricas, pero en la actualidad creo que se vuelve a, a poner de manifiesto que las colonias o, o al menos el proceso de colonización ha sido más voraz en, en esta parte de la ciudad por elementos históricos, entendibles, culturales, religiosos y quisiera saber cuál es su perspectiva del, del futuro de la ciudad, ¿Qué, qué, qué sé, qué, cuál es su perspectiva en términos, porque ha pasado, bueno, que si va a ser, eh, eh, pasamos por un protectorado en, en términos de que la, la, la comunidad internacional iba, iba a regir esta ciudad y demás y, y ahora qué podemos esperar de, de la ciudad de Jerusalén. Ok, eh, muy buenas preguntas eh, en inglés otra vez, lo lamento. Um, entonces, la the first question is on the on the banking system and the monetary system. I think that it is a very good question, which is not always uh, there's not always attention paid to it. And I think that the process you described, the ability gradually of the Zionists to create their own banking system, and to some extent uh, their own monetary system, which was limited because. The British mandate until 48 ruled the entirety of Western Palestine. It's precisely the logic of pure settlement. That's what gave them power. It's not only a matter of the actual economic transactions, it's also the symbolism that this is a separate universe, that it's separate from both the metropole and certainly from the indigenous people. This is precisely the logic of um, pure settlement colony, and this is the logic of the, of the two-state solution, um, which continues. I think it's, it's based on that. Now, but the mixture, I think uh, the difference is, I know it's not PC to say, but I'll say it anyway, and you can crucify me <laughs> as soon as I say it, is that in Palestine, Israel, Unlike any other, almost Argentina is probably the only place, and even then I'm not sure that it is as perfect, there is no mesticization at all. Um, I, I know of a, one private case in which there was, and I won't bother you with the story, although it's quite juicy, but, but on the whole, um, except for the Jewish women who fell in love in droves with Mahmoud Darwish, um, there was no systematic mysticization of the kind that happened in certain parts, but not insignificant parts of the Latin American quanti uh, continent, or the, the American continent in general. So I think in that sense too, it's a separation that is almost unprecedented and un unequal. It's the, the, the settler antigen fault line is almost perfectly kept. It was more porous in this period of the first Aliyah, but even then there was very little, uh, misogyn call it miscegenation, call it mesticization. Um, so the two communities remain ethnically and nationally and separated to a really almost a perfect degree. Um, the alternative to the two-state solution. I am, first of all, to say I'm now separating anything that I would like to happen, and I'm trying to give you a cold-hearted, as objective as I can, um, description or analysis. In my view, there is no alternative to the two-state solution, but there's also no um, prospect for the two-state solution. It doesn't mean that that's what I would like to happen, but in my view, that's what is going to happen in the near future. In, in my view, the Israelis and the Zionists before them never, in, at any moment that, in which it was possible, ever intended to allow Palestinian sovereignty over Western Palestine. They foiled it in different ways, and the more power they have, the more I wouldn't say effectively, but the more blatantly they do it. 
And the situation in that small portion of Palestine, which is itself very small, the 22%, which include Gaza, um, is such that it has been irreversible for a long time. Now, what will happen, I'm not saying that it will happen as a result of an orderly solution. It will not. And I can only give you my sense or my prediction for <laughs> whatever it's worth. Um, I think that, again, I repeat it, in the history known to me, no settler society allowed um, native or indigenous sovereignty unless it collapsed. So the French and the French, the Pied Noir lost in 62, left Algeria, and, but they didn't allow it. it. It was forced upon them. But if the settlers have the power to decide and control the situation, they don't allow native sovereignty of any kind. So this is not going, what will happen, I think, gradually, and perhaps it's already happening, is A, that the Palestinian generation or the leadership generation of Palestinian leadership, the current one, will gradually disappear first and foremost through biology. They are completely committed viscerally to sovereignty. And I can understand why. I'm not criticizing them for that. The younger generation, I think, will come to terms with the fact that sovereignty is unattainable unless they want to capitulate and have a small bantustan between Ramallah and Jenin where they can put little flags on the sewage or something like that. But otherwise, they will discard the notion of sovereignty or the adherence to sovereignty and gradually will turn to the struggle of civil rights and gradually will say to the Israelis, we are here, make us citizens. We, we've given up sovereignty. I'm not saying that it will happen in such a declaration, and I'm not saying also that the Israelis tomorrow, because of that, will make them citizens. Of course not. And certainly when they have the backing of both Europe and, and the US. But I think this is the, if anything will change in the future, in the Palestinian, on the Palestinian side, this is what will change. I think the Israelis, from their point of view, have no reason to change. Colonizers don't change because of morality. They change because they are forced to change. The moment there's nothing forcing, forcing the Israelis to change, as far as I can see. They are immensely more powerful. They have automatic ba uh, backing from the US. And they have basically have, I mean, the Europeans are making noises, but it's more noises than, than anything substantial. So for the time being, if you can go to shopping mall Azrieli, which is the embodiment of the shopping mall, at the heart of Tel Aviv, five minutes from the military headquarters, on Friday afternoon and have your shopping peacefully while 100,000 Palestinians are in a concentration camp. 10 minutes away in Kalkilia, why should you change? It, morally, it's of course repugnant, <laughs> no question about it, but not morally, it's a perfectly livable life. Um, so I don't think in that sense there will be very immediate change. Um, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is obviously uh, the one that, of all the sites, the site concerning which they are most zealous. And what has been happening in Jerusalem, in my view, is straightforward ethnic cleansing, in which um, the, the, the Arab part of Jerusalem is being through a variety of mechanisms that you know as well as I, legal, straightforward, uh, forceful, and others, is just being emptied of Arabs. Um, and so, in my view, maybe I'm too pessimistic, but being uh, with all my, I don't know, it's more than uh, mine, but all my heart with the Palestinians, obviously, 
maybe I learned to be pessimistic and I should <laughs> train myself otherwise, but I think Jerusalem is lost. Um, I don't think it will ever be um, a site in, on which Palestinians have even partial sovereignty. Um, I think the ethnic cleansing, which again, people know it, most people, even those who are interested at the level of general descriptions of something terrible happening, but they don't know the details. The thoroughness of the Israeli administrative mechanism and military mechanism and collaboration with the settlers and financiers from the United States is such that I don't see how the Palestinians will have sufficient power to resist. Uh, I mean, they are, first of all, they are literally evacuating people and invading flats. It's, or, in, sorry, invading property, apartments, houses, and so on. And this is done with support of a very mighty military power. I mean, there may be a, an arrangement in Jerusalem where maybe a few Arabs will be able to stay. Maybe they'll have rights to access uh, the, uh, the Omar Masjid and the Al-Aqsa. But in terms of this being a divided uh, capital of two separate nation states or even Arabs having some right to live in Jerusalem, I think this is a done deal now. I'm sorry I'm being... Gracias, uh, uh, profesor, por, por su espléndida presentación. Um, mi pregunta tiene que ver con un concepto que usted mencionó, bueno, en algún momento habló de la verdadera izquierda. Eh, en este panorama tan desconcertante y desalentador, en muchos sentidos, eh, actualmente, ¿quién es esa true left? ¿Quién es, eh, ¿Quiénes son? ¿Cuántos son? ¿Cuáles son sus principales fuentes de, eh, y espacios de expresión y movilización en, en, en Israel? En, eh, ¿Pero ahora? O ahora. En, en la, Ah, ah, entiendo. Sí, sí, perdón. No, I, pero, pero porque... Usted hizo, sí, al, 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 habló de... De los 20. Sí. Así es, de los 20. Y esa... ¿Existe una true left ahora? ¿Y quiénes son? ¿Dónde están? ¿Qué, qué, qué hacen? Um, well, why, one way to answer it is that, in my view, you, you already know 10% of them, of the left. I mean, he's sitting here. That's, Um, but <laughs> to answer it a bit more seriously, um, I think to the extent that we can have a, a historical perspective, I think as long as the so-called left, Zionist left, I'm not talking about much Penn, that was a true left, but it was very marginal and very small, though very significant, but it, it obviously no longer exists. I think that the left suffered, has suffered through the years in Israel from the hegemonic domination of the Labour Party, which is not really left, but it was the guiding framework and knew how to co-opt them all along. There was one opportunity, which now we know is lost, but historians are supposed to be able to look not teleologically, that we know the end of the story and it was always going there, but also in historicist terms, what was possible if we look at it from the point of view of the protagonists. There was an opportunity of a radical left, non-Zionist, eventually developing, following the 1982 Lebanon war. And I was part of that generation of an activist and so on. And Somehow, I'm not sure I can really explain it in, in an, an orderly fashion, one to three. It collapsed, and I think the Oslo Agreement killed it. But between, in that decade, there began to develop a, a real alternative of, of a radical left, which finally dissolved, and 
many of its members opted for individualistic intellectual pursuit with a certain degree of esprit de corps. Um, other than that, I think um, the left, the Zionist left, is completely impotent, has been unable to reach the masses because of its elitist approach, which, which it inherited from labor Zionism, out of which womb it was born. So it hasn't been able to, uh, to become a massive, popular, attractive party, like Likud at its height, not now, like Likud was. Um, it failed to do so because of all sorts of reasons. And since then, it's basically defensive. What it tries to explain is that, no, we are as patriotic as you are. We also fly F-16s and kill Palestinians. Um, even our women, we want, them, we want equal rights for them and for them to be able to bomb Palestinians as well. Um, and they are incapable of extricating themselves from this language of apologetics, of trying to say, we want the good of the state as much as you do, we think you're wrong. Um, and in moments of war, being unable to create a real opposition which opposes criminal wars. There is no Zionist left politician of, no, of note known to me who objected any criminal war beginning from 1982 to today. Um, they all, including Zahava Galon, including Yossi Sarid, all the leaders of merits, maybe Shulamit Aloni was a slight exception, she was more decent. But for instance, when wars were waged, they all mobilized for the national cause. They all say we are part of the, uh, of the national cause. Um, and uh, that willingness to participate and to insist we are as good Zionists as everyone else and not being able to see that that's where the problem lies in Zionism, not in who competes as to who is a better Zionist, means that um, in my view, for a long time, it's not, it's not at all a viable alternative. Uh. Nitsani, ah, well, Nitsani Lo Shadi. Right. Um, thanks for the talk. I have two, I'm going to make my questions in English too, because it's going to be easier for me to be clear. Um, <clears throat> two questions, one of a more historical, analytic nature, and the other one of a more political nature. Um, and the first one is, you know, often we have a tendency as academic to absolutize and to say it's either or. Uh, you know, so in the choice between, let's say, you know, pillage and murder and sla uh, slavery or extermination, which the two types of settler colonialism present, I wonder if it's not more a story of both as, you know, which I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything good about mm. it, right? But it sounded to me like the story, um, the, the history, perhaps not, perhaps against the plans and intentions of some of the leading figures and of how uh, the mainstream dominant Zionist movement would have liked it to turn out, um, in the end ended up being both. Uh, both exploitation and elimination, both ethnic cleansing and um, a diverse form of extra extraction of value, at least right. for long periods of that history, right? right? And with quite, and with divergences between the ideological part of it, which always put an emphasis on, on mm -hmm. ethnic yeah, cleansing. And so I, will, I would like you to, to provoke you a little bit to reflect okay. on that, whether that you could, you could go um, along that route or not, mm. or whether I'm totally right. wrong. Um, and, and in relation to that, to what extent really the project of uh, uh, sort of a pure settler colonialism can also be then in a sort of maybe potentially emancipatory way uh, said to have failed, as opposed to other uh, settler colonialism like United States, 
Canada, um, Australia, uh, in the end. Um, so that's one question that's more historical and analytical. And the other one is more political, but I think it's related mm -hmm. to that failure or to sort of the pessimism that you express and that I largely share, um, as I think most people coming from the region. Um, and that is, um, you know, you, you, you mentioned, I think correctly, that there's no reason for the Israelis really to change or to stop um, settler colonialism there, which is ongoing. Uh, as we know, and in that sense, and seeing as the geopolitics aren't going to change anymore, I'm going to put a very sensitive question to you, I know, and so if you prefer to uh, just let it go, just tell me, what's your take on the BDS movement nowadays? BDS. BDS. Boycott, divestment, uh, and, and sanctions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, my question is, is more to you as a historian. Um, we, right now, like we, we thought that the Ottoman Empire was, is long gone. And now all of a sudden, it's, it's back. back. No, people are talking about sex because frontiers. People are talking about the relevancy of Arab states, the relevancy of Arab nationalism, if what happened earlier was the right direction, if what were the mistakes that were taken. I'm referring to the Islamic State, I'm referring to everyone who has some plan of identity of borders in their drawer for the region now is coming up, you know, they were just waiting for the right moment for it, and now they're coming and redrawing the region. What's happening in Palestine and Israel in all of this? Is it still immune from everything around? Is it an enclave? Is it, can we still continue, can we continue to talk about it the same way we are used to continue about the conflict? Should we modify ourselves, right. etc.? Okay. And I have a little question. It's maybe not very little. <laughs> it's, it's about uh, uh, post-Zionism. Uh, apparently, I haven't read the book, but apparently uh, Ilan Pape thinks that it's dead for good. And uh, I read actually the, the Gilbert Ashkar's uh, review of uh, Pape's book, and he thinks that it could come back, and that could open some uh, space for optimism. What do you think? Okay, I'll, thank you. Well, thank you for the questions again. It's a wonderful opportunity to. Uh, so, f first of all, for um, Nitsan's uh, historical question. Um, first of all, I, let me be honest here, and because it's a, a lecture, of course, it, limited in time and so on, um, I prefer to portray a clear categorical picture of the basic terminology and what won the day in which place. And I think you're right, there is room for a more nuanced um, analysis, which say I would say it do in writing, or say I was teaching here a seminar with a series of lectures. I, so to give you one example which is not, uh, does not pertain to Palestine, Argentina is another example of a pure settlement colony in which the elimination of the, of the, of the Indians was done quite effectively, and not and with, within a short while. But so, and, and it's the same, I mean, the details of the ideology are not the same, but the re rejection of native labor is analogous or comparable. The closest they came to employing something looking like a non-white person were the gauchos. But the gauchos were obviously not Indians. But even in Argentina, there's a period between, say, the 1870s and the 1910s, which was eventually a failure, in which in the north of Argentina, in Tucumán, Salta, and Jujuy, they try to create sugar plantations in which they employ indentured Indian labor. And you can even see remnants of that, not of the labor, of course, but in, I don't know if, a wonderful Argentine filmmaker, Lucrecia Martel. Um, so in some of her movies, especially La Cienega, um, you can see the presence, I'm not saying it's still sugar plantations, of course, but 
Similarly, in, in Israel-Palestine, you have cases in which there is, in certain spheres of the economy, like building the settlements, for instance. Um, yeah, ironic though it sounds, it's an irony that even Marx couldn't fathom, I think. Um, the more general work they did between, say, the late 70s and the first intifada, and so on. So I think, on the one hand, you're right, and there is room for a more nuanced... Um, in the United States, on the other hand, it's, it's quite drastic. I mean, there is, of course, there is slavery, but it's not of natives, for the most part. But I think when, you, when one wants to do the balance, and especially the, that what I call the pure settlement colony state of mind, on the balance, it's, it trumps the other option. I'm not, so I would agree with you that you're right, that especially in a, in a more nuanced historical analysis, these cases have to be mentioned, discussed, and also their importance. So we know, that, I mean, to put it crudely, uh, in terms of primitive accumulation, please excuse me for my, my Marxian bias, I know it's out of fashion, and now it's identity and LGBT, and <laughs> I'm still an old Marxian, what can I do? Uh, in terms of primitive accumulation, um, the white man accrues private property in, in whatever way he can, and if there's an opportunity to accrue it from exploitation or, or use of the surplus value of native labor, they would do it. But on the whole, these cases are cases that are more explicable by the pure settlement, call it mentality of state of mind or formation than the other one with, I accept your, uh, I accept your comment. Now, BDS, um, well, to state first, yeah, I'm in favor. I, I mean, I support, I supported it openly, and uh, I don't need to tell you, or perhaps I do need to tell you what, uh, what I got in the, I, I don't know why they insist that I'm a self-hating Jew. I mean, I'm the first son of a Jewish mother. If I have a problem, it's not that I hate myself, but I like myself too much. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they still insist. I think the BDS, movement is justified for two reasons. Um, first of all, sorry, just to add to that, I'm in favor of an institutional and clever BDS. In other words, if I, as director of the Center for Near East Studies, want to invite, say, I'm using a name that is familiar perhaps to some of you, maybe not all of you, I'm non Raz Krakotskin from Ben Gurion University, I would have to be utterly stupid to say, well, the BDS includes him as well. I mean, there's no better speaker for the, for, for the cause of the Palestinians than, than that person. So I, I should be a complete idiot to, um, to apply the BDS to him. But that said, institutions, there are two reasons. One, we can argue for a long time whether it helps or not, whether it's effective or not, as Chomsky claims and so on. But it is one mechanism, one means, among others, to try to make sure that the Israelis have a reason to change. So I don't think the BDS in and of itself will end the occupation and so on, but it is a legitimate, in the circumstances, uh, mechanism that I support. The second reason is that although there are a few Israeli radicals in the universities who, whom I know and who are my friends, like Amnon, like Shlomo Zand, like Niv Gordon, who on, on Friday will be speaking at UCLA on the issue of human shields in the, in the Gaza atrocity and so on. As institutions, the Israeli universities are um, collude with the occupation with the atrocities that the state of Israel uh, perpetrates, and not only collude, but are active participants in all sorts of ways. And that is getting worse. And also the measures taken against dissidents or oppositional 
faculty members within the universities and the attempt to discipline them are growing. For all these reasons, I support BDS. Um, now, the Ottoman Empire. Um, I'm, I'm, of course, originally an Ottoman historian, and the, the Ottomans had, at the height of their imperial arrogance, which they were entitled to have, given their success, they had this um, slo imperial slogan in Turkish, but you, it's Arabic, basically. Devleti aliye daiman muzafere, or al daula al ulia daiman muzafere. The sublime state is always victorious. So maybe that's a, this slogan returning with vengeance. Um, I mean, I think what's happening is that in, if we can take a long durée view of the, of the process, which I'm not sure we can because we are still within it, I think if you think about it, the collapse of such a powerful, the most powerful and largest and longest enduring Islamic empire ever in the history of Islam. Um, collapsing after, depending which region you're referring to, between six and four hundred years of existence and rule, it's a big thing. It's not easy to recover from it. Um, and the, one of the consequences of this, which now we can see in retrospect, is the fragility of the Sykes-Picot arrangements. Because all the areas of instability in the Middle East are the product of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the carving up of the Middle East between the two main colonial powers, France and Britain. So Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, which is a different arrangement, I agree, and Israel-Palestine, which is again something different, but they are all results of the post-World War I arrangements and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire are a cause of, of instability or a source of instability. And I mean, it's not, in my view, it's not a coincidence that Egypt, despite its own trials and tribulations, is relatively stable. It's not a result of that arrangement. Um, nor is, by the way, Saudi Arabia, which is another, of course, artificial creation, but it was not something that the French and the British created. So, of course, we are not going to see, apart from uh, Erdogan's being ego egomaniacal, we are not going to see the return of the Ottoman Empire um, as such, although I swear to you, sometimes I wish. Because, not because they were, of course, they were not democratic and uh, were not um, wary of using violence, shall we say, like all empires. But for God's sake, they knew how to rule. I mean, they really knew how to rule. And there was, what followed them is, is not of the same <laughs> degree of, uh, shall we say, competence. So, I mean, I, to, to go to the latter part of your question, I mean, it, it reminds me, not that I'm attributing it to you, I'm not, but it reminds me of the logic of the Zionist left, which I always reject, which is, their logic is, something's got to give. You can't rule another people for so long and nothing will happen. Um, at some point, there will be pressure by, uh, by this or by that or by one or by the other. I don't accept it. Why is it inevitable? If you have such an asymmetry of power and technology, you can rule for a long time. You can make sure that uh, some aggressive Islamic force like ISIS or Daesh uh, will actually be neutralized as far as you're concerned. So there is something that is the presupposition that because logically the situation is unsustainable, it is really unsustainable. But from to, to play the devil's advocate, other than that it, the fact that it's morally repugnant, of course, why is it unsustainable? 
why should it come, why something's got to give. So one of the arguments of the Zionist left is that if uh, this continues, this is their usual rhetoric, like if you read in R, it's the Zev Sternhell and others, if this continues, then we will not be able to sustain a Jewish democratic state. Well, I have news for you, there was never a Jewish democratic state. There was a Jewish state, there was never a democratic state. So, they can sustain it. I mean, I think these, these, this logic that in and of itself there's something inherent in the structure, and what Nitzan said earlier in a completely different context, history is very nuanced and it doesn't necessarily behave by logic. So by logic you should have pure settlement colony if you don't want native labor and that's it, and eliminate them. In reality you get the mixture in which one is heavier than the other and they somehow coexist and it's not logical. That, I mean the analogy is that I don't accept as bad as it sounds, it sounds too bad to me, I mean, the first person to whom it sounds bad is me, is that because the situation is terrible and because it has inherent contradictions, supposedly it can't last for, for forever. Uh, well, it can, in my view. Alas, regrettably, it can. Um, and the fact that the Israelis are not changing, even after the threats from the European Union, and af even after that, not by governments, but by societies, they are, their popularity is at all-time low. Not only in Mexico, in, in most West European societies. But they don't change, and I think they read the picture, their reading is not bad, actually, from their point of view. They have no reason to change. Now, post-Zionism. Um, I disagree with my very good friend, Ilan Pape. Um, I don't think Zionism ever disappeared. I think post-Zionism is an unsustainable position, and if you asked me to define myself, I never, I'd never define myself as, as, as post-Zionist. I'm anti-Zionist. Um, so, post-Zionism as a position is uh, untenable, and I think it's even cowardly. Because there is no post-Zion, there is no, that, that's why I, in my, in my lecture, invasion is a structure, not an event. Settler colonialism doesn't end uh, in most cases. Try telling, I'm not talking about Palestinians in the occupied territories, is, but Palestinians who are citizens of Israel or members of the First Nations in Canada, that they live in a post-settler colonial situation. They would be completely baffled by the proposition. So I completely reject it. I, I don't see on what basis it can be said that Zionism ever died, ever disappeared, and suddenly that we are in a post I mean, why? What happened? I mean, land is not being appropriated. Uh, people are not being ethnically cleansed. Why is Zionism dead or disappeared? Or It's alive and kicking. And there is no post. Both, in my view, there is no post, either as a position, uh, and certainly not as an, as an actual situation. Bueno, pues, uh, muchísimas gracias, Gabriel. Es mi, es mi honor. Muchas gracias.